NRC in Bhutan, distinguished experts and participants. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome all and thank you for joining us today to the conference on capital market development in Bhutan, leveraging private finance through green and sustainable bonds. My name is Pashala from financing for development section of macroeconomic policy and financing for development division of UNSCAP. I will be MC today to facilitate virtual meeting. Uh, as from the meeting concept note, we are together to explore challenges and needs of green and sustainable bond for Bhutan. Uh, the meeting will discuss and assess the progress on issuing green bond, focusing on examine key challenges, propose the optimal financial terms for the green bonds in Bhutan and seek inclusive feedback from all relevant stakeholders. Before we start, may I kindly ask uh, our not speaking to mute your microphone, please. Okay, let's start at the opening session. I would like to invite Dr. Tianchip Supanish to give the opening remarks. Dr. Tianchip, the floor is yours. Okay. Um... Thank you very much, uh, uh, Pachara, for the introduction. So good afternoon uh, from Bangkok, and I believe it's also afternoon in Bhutan. Uh, Mr. Gerald Daly, United Nations Resident Coordinator in Bhutan. Mr. Dasho Nimdoji, Secretary, Ministry of Finance of Bhutan. Distinguished experts, participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of UNSCAP, I am pleased to welcome all of you to this virtual conference market development in Bhutan, leveraging private finance through green and sustainable bonds. I would like to begin by expressing my utmost gratitude to the Royal Government of Bhutan, in particular the Ministry of Finance for their strong collaboration with UNSCAP and for co-hosting this virtual meeting with us today. I also appreciate all participants' presence at this important conference during this difficult time. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, UNSCAP has a long engagement with the Royal Government of Bhutan and has been actively assisting the Royal Government in issuing its long-awaited green bonds. We are very pleased that with the Royal Government's commitment in developing capital market, Bhutan has successfully issued its first ever Soviet bond in September this year. I'm pleased also to learn that um, it is very well received with the transaction over 300% over subscription. This positive result is a monumental step in enhancing Bhutan's financing option as the country, in addition to fiscal revenues, has relied mainly on grants, treasury bills, concessional loans, and overseas development assistance. Bhutan has also successfully demonstrated how a capital market can be created and functional in a small economy with the right mindset policy approach. Ladies and gentlemen, as part of SCAP's ongoing efforts to help member states build and strengthen financing capacity, my Financing for Development team has been working on the strategic issues of financial resource mobilization in Bhutan and other developing countries since 2017. For Bhutan, we have conducted a series of tailored capacity building workshops, study tour, and consultations, as well as supported the setting up of bond working committee, rules and regulations for bond issuance. Those activities were aimed at unlocking innovative financing mechanism in Bhutan's capital market in order to bridge the resource gap to finance the country's socioeconomic development in the medium and long terms. As we all know, despite remarkable progress that Bhutan has made, progress is a never-ending journey, and much remains to be done with numerous challenges for Bhutan yet to be overcome. To sustain the momentum of the recent success of bond issuance, UNSCAP stands ready to further support the royal government in deepening bond market and developing other innovative financial instruments to support capital market development in Bhutan. For more than 15 years, we have seen very strong rise in the issuance of thematic green and sustainable bonds. The signature of the Paris Agreement in 2015 
as well as the adoption of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, have triggered the opening of a new market segment with the emergence of green bond as a new financial instrument that responds to the need of global institutional investors to invest their capital. And this is especially true for those investors who has appetite for green and climate resilient investment. At the same time, other types of securities have been designed to respond to other types of challenges. Social bonds, for example, have become an instrument of choice for projects that have an objective of solving social issues. Similarly, SDG aligned bonds have a mandate to align projects with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And especially after this COVID-19 pandemic, we have also seen a tremendous rise of bond issuance under thematic issues. This conference, therefore, offers a great opportunity to prepare for the future and discuss the possibility of issuing innovative financial products such as thematic green and sustainable bonds with our experts, representatives from the government agencies, financial and research institutes, banks and other key stakeholders. Ladies and gentlemen, as green and thematic bonds could prov provide a great opportunity to gain commitment of long term quality investors and help raise the pool of capital available. It is important that we carefully consider these alternative financing options, while at the same time ensuring that financial stability is in place going forward. I hope that today's conference will provide us with good insights to further strengthen financing capabilities of Bhutan in this post COVID-19 world. I wish the conference a great success and look forward to a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. And over to you, Pachara. Thank you, Dr. Tianti, for framing the meeting we will be having today. Um, I would like now to invite Mr. Jorao Dali, United Nations Resident Coordinator in Bhutan to deliver your welcome remark. Mr. Dali, please. Um, Thank you, Kuhn. Um, could you pull up the, the, the first of the three slides? Yes, that's okay. Kuzuzon Bola. Dasho Nim Dorji. Colleagues at SCAP. Colleagues around Asia and perhaps in different parts of the world. I want to do four things in the next five minutes. So I'm going to be going quite fast. The first thing is I want to provide background for where we are right now. The second thing I want to talk about is and essentially the, my first message my first message is on what I call the COVID dividend. The second message is climate financing. And the third one is an ask to all colleagues in the United Nations, an ask. So I'm going to start with the background. And I propose to all of you today that we are living in a VUCA world. Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. Quite a different world to where we were at this time last year. As the Secretary General has recently said, instead of a recovery that could take one or two years, we might face a depression for five to seven years. This type of a VUCA world, I commend the thinking of Warren Buffett. In his February newsletter, he said, don't depend upon the kindness of strangers, nor the kindness of friends. Kuhn, could you go to the second slide? So, COVID. This is a challenge of a very significant proportion. In my opinion, COVID is very similar to an iceberg. We're probably only seeing somewhere around 10% of actually what's going on. There's a lot that we're not seeing. And 
because we're not able to see so much, we need to be extra astute, extra astute. The last slide, Kun, is the qualities of a raven. And of course, those of us who have a close affinity to Bhutan will understand the image of the raven. Ravens are known to be adaptable. If you could stay with the slide, Kun, they're known to be adaptable. They're known to be problem solving experts. They believe in cooperation and teamwork. They are astute and clever. And it is the, on the basis of the Raven that I wish to share with you the three key messages today. As much as possible, we need to be looking for a COVID dividend, a COVID dividend. We need to be looking for the opportunity in this challenge of COVID. So, for example, the sovereign bond, which the Royal Government of Bhutan has instituted in September 2020, is part of what I would call a COVID dividend. The Royal Government of Bhutan realizes that it needs to adapt to these current circumstances. And I believe the issuing of the sovereign bond in September is part of this innovation that we see coming out of and perhaps influenced by COVID. Another example is what's happening in this opening of parliament we see tomorrow. We see on the agenda that the Royal Government of Bhutan is taking on a new relationship with the European Investment Bank. I wish to take this opportunity to commend Dasher Nim and his colleagues for taking on these innovations and guiding Parliament. One additional topic which I would bring to your attention in terms of a COVID dividend is my support for and active support for the strengthening of Bhutan's Economic Stabilization Fund, the Bhutan Economic Stabilization Fund. The more we're able to strengthen that, the more we as a country, the more Bhutan as a country will be able to get through tough times. That's your name, of course, you're much more aware and your colleagues of the current underpinnings of the Bhutan Economic Stabilization Fund. Given the challenges that many are seeing in the international environment, I believe additional energy and commitment to, to the Bhutan Economic Stabilization Fund at this time deserves serious consideration. That was my first message. My second message is on climate financing. Many people believe, and I would agree with them, that traditional patterns of ODA, traditional patterns of ODA are almost dead in the water. Traditional patterns of ODA are unlikely to continue as strong as they have been. However, climate financing does seem to be an area with good opportunities. And in this regard, I commend to Dasher Nim what is called the Kyrgyzstan's Climate Finance Center for Low Carbon Invest Infrastructure Investments. Let me quote from you from a recent documentation that the United Nations prepared for the 21st Century Economic Roadmap. The Kyrgyzstan authorities established the Climate Finance Center to coordinate climate finance approaches with multiple stakeholders. The CFC designs and implements investment projects for low carbon, climate resilient infrastructure in priority sectors. Financial resources from international climate funds, MDBs, international organizations, and bilateral donors. I commend this, in this type of a Kyrgyzstan Climate Finance Center for consideration here in Bhutan, because we can see that there are opportunities around climate financing for Bhutan, 
And the more we streamline those opportunities, the more divot, the more benefit we will derive for Bhutan. That was my second message. My third message is a request to colleagues in the United Nations, but any other development partner who's working with any country around the world. We need to change the way we do capacity building. The old model for capacity building probably needed to change. It probably needed to change. My own sense at the moment is we need to shift to what I would call a training through doing procedure. Training through doing. That's not to say that a one hour or two hour Zoom call has not got some good benefit. It does have some good benefit. But we need to go to a deeper level of depth of capacity building over the internet with a limited number of people identified by people like Dash and Nim and give them incredible depth of specific knowledge that is of direct benefit for them in the way they do their work. So let me summarize. We live in a VUCA world and we need to adapt to that VUCA world. And I believe the qualities of a raven will serve as well. I believe in my first message, I emphasize the importance of looking for a COVID dividend. Look for the opportunities in this challenging times we are in. The second one is climate financing. And we have some good examples from Kyrgyzstan on how they have been able to take climate financing and streamline the benefits. And finally, third message was a new type of capacity building for these challenging times. Colleagues, Dasha Nim, thank you for listening to my few words. I commend the work that you're doing. I really believe that this is right at the cutting edge of helping countries to be self-sustaining, which from my point of view is the heart of good development. Kuhn, Tintep, back to you. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Gerald. And I think um, also over to you, Pachara, for um, Okay, th and, yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dari, for your special remarks. Uh, now it's my honor to request Excellency Dasho Nim Dorji, Secretary, Ministry of Finance of Bhutan, to give opening remarks. Dasho, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Gerald Delhi, uh, UN Resident Coordinator, Tinti, Chief Financing for Development, UNSCAP, distinguished participants from Bhutan, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all distinguished participants joining us today on this virtual platform to discuss on capital market development in Bhutan leveraging private finance through green and sustainability bonds, organized by the UNSCAP in joint collaboration with Minister of Finance. I would also like to welcome two of our resource persons, Professor Yoshino and uh, Professor Chang, whose knowledge expertise will enlighten and enrich this virtual conference today. At the outset, let me thank UNSCAP for organizing this workshop and working very closely with Minister of Finance in terms of developing the capital market in Bhutan and helping us to take this bold step of moving forward with raising funds from the domestic market. Minister of Finance has been working very closely with major development partners, including multilateral development banks and UN agencies for development of capital market and promoting innovative financing such as green bonds and sustainable bonds, which has been gaining lots of traction in many countries around the world. The pandemic has overwhelmed the public health system and impacted the global economy into a deep recession with growth forecasts of IMF going as deep as minus 4% for the 2020. 
The rebound from this recession is likely to take longer time. That's going to be uneven and highly uncertain. So Bhutan has been no exception. The economic fallout that primarily transmitted through the tourism related and allied sector has spread over to other sectors such as construction and manufacturing. Industrial production has been severely affected due to disruption in supply chain and then labor shortages. Against this backdrop, the economic growth even for Bhutan is estimated to decelerate further to minus six from June estimates of 2.1. As part of the response to COVID-19 pandemic and to offset the loss of GDP growth, our government of Bhutan has approved high level of capital spending for the fiscal year 2021 and implemented economic contingency plan with the budget deficit maintaining at 7% of GDP, one of the highest in the recent past. One of the unique measures under implementation is the grant of His Majesty's Relief Kidu for the people who have been affected by the pandemic and also support of interest waiver for all borrowers from the period 2020 to March 2021. As a response, a national resilience fund has been already established with a fund size of US dollar 400 million. And this has been used to respond to the needs for providing relief kidu by His Majesty. In order to meet the increasing demand for developing financing needs, the government of Bhutan has mobilized grants from development partners and concessional borrowings from multilateral banks such as ADB, World Bank. The residual of the fiscal deficit is being financed through domestic borrowing. It is in this context the government of Bhutan has issued uh, on regular basis treasury bills and then the first sovereign bond which has already been referred to by UNSCAP. The conference today will provide an excellent platform to discuss opportunities and challenges in moving forward from issuance of conventional government debt instruments which is referred to as government bonds to modern thematic based instruments such as green bonds, impact investment and innovative financing mechanisms which incorporates ESG, Environment and Sustainable Governance, in Bhutan. The Economic Stabilization Fund, which uh, Gerald referred to, has been established and it is at an early stage of operation. Indeed, during this uh, pandemic, during the crisis, we are contemplating to already use the Economic Stabilization Fund to meet our financing needs. Bhutan has also reached to an advanced stage of operationalizing the Bhutan Climate Fund in close partnership with World Bank. These financing mechanisms present a new path for Bhutan to harness the opportunities that lies within ourselves. The presentation by two experts today will also provide information and experiences in such areas and interest. I'm sure that all participants will greatly benefit from the presentation and discussion. During the last few years, Bhutan has made tremendous progress in developing the capital market. Presently, the pandemic has provided indeed force upon us to harness the potential in raising funds through use of green and innovative financing mechanism to meet development financing requirements. Besides developing capital market, provide support to monitor operations and support the economy in fighting the pandemic. It is also timely to see that such financing mechanisms are used as COVID dividend as referred by Gerald. The rural government of Bhutan has issued its first government bond worth 3 billion to finance the fiscal deficit and facilitate development of the domestic capital market. The issuance of the bond is, has supported the economy in recovery from COVID-19 pandemic while di diversifying financial resources. This historical move has significantly expanded our fiscal management space while diversifying debt resources through opening up a new channel for long-term public borrowing. The first ever sovereign bond issued has encouraged private sector participation, including large number of individual investors, and has provided important lessons in financing for development in the era of COVID-19 and beyond. This debt instrument used by Bhutan could be an example for the least developed countries with underdeveloped financial uh, infrastructure could issue sovereign bonds as a tool for economic recovery and capital market development. 
Bhutan provides utmost priority to conserving its environment, which is manifested through Bhutan's unique development philosophy of gross national happiness, which emphasizes environmental sustainability as an integral component of development and institutional mandates that we maintain 60% of our country under forest cover for all times to come. However, environmental conservation requires resources where public funding for conservative efforts is vital. They can only finance a small portion of what is required, which means private capital will have to be leveraged to meet most of these investment needs. Therefore, given Bhutan's leadership in protecting environment and commitment to sustainable development goals, it is important for RGOB to seriously consider expanding the scope of its sovereign bonds to more thematic bonds such as green bonds or sustainability bonds, with, including climate finance and uh, ESG, both domestic and international investors, to take advantage of cheaper borrowing costs while ensuring well thought out set of regulations and policies governing bond issues. Then. There is huge potential for the country to tap into green sustainability bond markets, climate financing to finance its infrastructure projects. However, issuance of green bond or sustainable bond would be simple or easy process as it involves complex processes such as selection of appropriate project, external review, development of the framework, <coughs> impact reporting and auditing. Therefore, this will require capacity development and uh, handling of such complex project and costly process. So there's opportunity to work with international organizations like UNSCAP, multilateral development banks and experts to provide handholding and new capacity building support. This is where Gerald has also highlighted. Well, development and financing, sustainable financing have been encouraging. We are still at the initial phase of development and a lot more still needs to be done. Today's forum is most welcome opportunity to help chart our way forward. I look forward to working closely with the UN scale, uh, UN agencies in Bhutan, multilateral development banks, to pursue our common effort to develop sustainable capital market development in Bhutan. Once again, thank you, UN scale, for organizing the conference. I wish everyone a productive deliberation and successful workshop. I would also like to thank uh, my colleagues from Bhutan participating into this workshop. Thank you, and Tash Telek. Thank you, Dashar Nimnajit, for the insightful speech. Uh, indeed, COVID-19 affected our, our life in an unprecedented way. Obviously, we meet today not in person, but via online connection. Before we move to the, to the session, uh, distinguished speaker and participant, I would like to uh, propose for take the group photo. Uh, for first batch of the, the photos, for all the speaker, uh, including Masato, please to turn on your camera. Okay. Um, um, yeah, yeah, um, sorry, so for, for, for Ye Chi, Da Sang, could you turn off? Your camera for for this batch. That sound namke. If you could turn off your camera. Okay. Three, two, one. Sama. <laughs> one more. Three, two, one. Okay. Um. For the memory of the meeting, I kindly request, if possible, for all the participants to turn on your camera, please, for the memorable virtual group photo, please. Show us your handsome, beautiful faces. Mm -hmm. Okay. Three, two, one. Okay, thank you very much for it. Okay, let's let's now continue our discussion and hear from speaker. We have two eminent speakers with extensive experiences and expertise. 
today we have two sessions. Session one on the key challenges and opportunities of sovereign green thermatic bonds in Bhutan, and session two for optimal financial terms for green bond. Um, let's start session session one. I would like to welcome Dr. Masato Abe as moderator for the session. Masato, the floor is yours. Th th thank you, Kumbu. Thank you so much for your very able, you know, the, the <laughs> moderatorship. You know, thank, thank you so, thank you, thank you so much. You're welcome, thank you. So yeah, so I'm honored to be, uh, you know, the moderating this particular session. You know, today you know, for this session we have, uh, you know, the only one distinguished, you know, the speaker from Tokyo, Tokyo, Japan, uh, Professor uh, uh, Naoki Yoshino. Uh, who is uh, the, the uh, Professor Emeritus of KO University, the former uh, Dean of the Asia Development Bank Institute, Tokyo area, until, until early, early this year. And now he is uh, still teach, you know, the teaching at the University of Tokyo and GRIPS, you know, both of you know, the, the, the Tokyo, 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 Japan. Uh, I have, you know, the known him many years, you know, one reason is, of course, he's a very famous, you know, macro, you know, the economist of, you know, one of the top, you know, the macro economist, you know, the Japan. But at the same time, you know, the Professor Yoshino have been, you know, the helping us, you know, the UNS care for variety of the capacities and often come to the, uh, our meeting as well. So I've known him, you know, the more than 10 years now, right? Yeah, and uh, the one distinct, you know, the, the kind of uh, his career is uh, he has been the uh, chairperson, chairperson of the uh, Japanese government bond investor meeting under the Minister of you know, the Finance. I understand that more than 20 years by now. He is a real expert in the sovereign, you know, government bond of Japan, and also he's providing the variety of the uh, such as, you know, that uh, he's, you know, that the, the lectures and, the, you know, technical assistant to service to the, the variety of the developing, you know, the countries. Yeah. And also, you know, the relating to Bhutan, I would like to mention one thing that, right? Now, you know, the Professor Yoshino has the uh, uh, close, you know, the, the student, you know, the under, you know, the him at the University of Tokyo. Me, uh, Mr., you know, the ESC Lendo, he's also, you know, the, Associate and the friend, colleague at the Ministry of Finance of the Bhutan. Now he's, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the providing the research assistant to Professor Yoshino. So now, you know, that, the, uh, you know, two, two of the uh, my you know, known people, right, you know, work, working together, you know, the, 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 you know, as, since I, I did that. I'm happy to see such a development as well. So now I'm stopped to talking, you know, the, the, the introduction of the Professor Yoshino and uh, want to, you know, the, the bring, the, you know, the give the floor to Professor Yoshino. But before that, I have a quick question to the Professor Yoshino. Do you want to take the question, you know, the, during the, your lectures or you uh, want to take a question? I, 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 I hope I can, I can talk about 45, 50 minutes. And then after that, I'd like to take questions and answers. Okay, but some okay. immediate questions, I can take it. Okay. okay. So yeah, so, thank you for your flexibility. So in that case, you know, the two all you know the distinct participants and the expert, you know, uh, from the, uh, the the Bhutan and also outside the Bhutan. You know, if you have uh, any pressing, you know, pressing, you know, the, the question, please, you know, the ask, you know, such a question, you know, the immediately, right? Such a such a question could, you know, the even help, you know, the Professor Yoshina's, you know, the the, the you know. Uh, you know, the lectures and uh, the knowledge, knowledge transfer from him to your side, you know. So if you have any pressing, you know, question, please, you know, the raise such a question, okay, by, by your voice or by, you know, the raising a hand, right? So having said so, I would like to, you know, the, the, the transfer the floor to Professor Yoshino. Professor Yoshino, you know, the floor is yours. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much, Dr. Masato Abe, for, in, for your nice introduction. As I was introduced, I was the Dean and CEO of Asian Development Bank Institute for six years until March this year. And I was also the chairperson of Japanese government bond market, which was initiated about 20 years ago. So I was the first chairperson, I'm still the chairperson. So I know the development of bond market, especially of Japan 
and selected Asian countries. So today's presentation is based on those experiences. So please go to the next page. Uh, outline of my presentation, there are about eight sections. First one is I'll talk about experience of Japanese government bond market. Japan has started in 1965, which Bhutan has started this year. But the process of the development a Japanese experience may help to Bhutan. Secondly, in the bond market, Japanese central bank intervened and negative interest rate policy had been prevailing. So I'd like to talk about how negative interest rate policy be possible in the bond market. Third one is rate of return, interest rate. What is the interest rate Bhutan should set up the bond market? Number four is fiscal sustainability. Once you start issuing government bonds, sustainability of the bond market is very important. And number five, tax exemption of government bond. I'm not recommending, but I'd like to talk about the interest rate and so on. And number, seven, number six is green bond. There are lots of examples of green bond in Europe and other countries. Number seven is the monetary policy and the bond market, especially short-term interest rate and long-term government bond market. And last one is policy recommendations. So those are my structure of today. Please go to the next page. Previous page, you jumped. Yes. So when Bhutan starts issuing bond, you have to always look at government spending and tax revenues. This red line is Japanese government spending. 2020, this year, huge jump because of COVID-19. And tax revenue, this gap is the bottom bar line. These are the issue of government bonds every year. So since Bhutan started to issue government bonds, you have to keep these diagrams, just like Japanese case, every year in future. This is very important. What are the gap between spending and tax revenues? If you can see here, until 1990s, it was almost parallel. But after that, the difference between the two has been increasing significantly. One of the reasons is aging population of Japan and slow economic growth. Please go to next. Next page, we will look at the debt to GDP ratio. Top one is Japan, and then uh, US, uh, France, and other countries. As you can see, Japan is far ahead of other countries. And this Japanese debt to GDP ratio is higher than Greece. And many people know Greece went into bankrupt, but Japan is still sustained. That is the secrecy which I'm going to talk today, why Japan is sustained and Greece went into bankrupt. Please go to next. This figure shows about top part is revenues and bottom part is uh, uh, expenses. And first law here uh, is social security and then public works and so on. So as you can see here, the social security is one of the largest among Japanese government spending. This is why Japanese budget deficit has started to increase because of aging population. And top part is various tax revenues. So between these two gaps, revenue uh, minus our expense, or expense minus revenues, those are the issue of government bond. And please go to next. Then as you can see here, after the start of the government bond, bond Japan has differentiated two kinds of government bonds. One is construction bonds, which were used for infrastructure investments. Another one is deficits bonds, these are social security and help of elderly people 
and medical spending. So there are two kinds of bonds. Of course, they are circulating as the same government bonds, but in the books, in the Ministry of Finance, they differentiate it to the two because construction bond will be productive infrastructure investment that will create much more spillover effects and economic growth. But deficits bonds just for social welfare, security to elderly people, it will not be productive. So in Japan, we have differentiated two different kinds of bonds. One is construction bonds, which are blue line, and red line is deficits bonds. And please go to next. This is the annual plan of what kind of government bonds Japan is going to issue. If you can see here on the left hand side, longest one is 40 years, 30 years, 20 years, 10 years, five years, two years, and short term government bonds. So Japan has variety of government bonds. Traditionally, originally, Japan started only 10 five year government bonds because Japanese government bonds are mainly sold to banks and banks preferred about seven years, five years. But insurance companies, pension funds preferred long term. So government bonds has to match with the demands of government bank holders. So in Bhutan's case, our initial issue will be three years, but you can expand much longer term as long as your insurance and pension funds are growing. So left hand side in Japanese case is issue of government bonds and different kinds. Then here are uh, each issue and how many times does government issue government bonds? For example, 30 years, 12 times. So every month, two years, every month, but 40 years, six times. So every once, every two. So I think kinds of the bonds and also kinds of the investors issue plan is different. Then this is the amount issued and total amount of the issue of each maturity. And please go to next. Okay, these plans are determined by this Japan, JGB, Japanese government bond investors meeting. As you can see here in the bottom, I am chairing this uh, council for 20 years since the start. Then here, those are the participants, banks, insurance companies, pension funds. So these are about 15 investors who are investing into Japanese government market. There are one or two foreign investors are also are participating in this council. And then we plan how much demand each investor have. Banks will tell at the beginning, they have certain amount of investment, then insurance companies, pension funds, and many people about different maturities. And please go to next. Because of these issues, government will set up a yield curve. Long term is higher interest rate and short term is lower interest rate. And because Japanese government wants years, so this yield curve has been smoothly drawn right now. But Bhutan's case, first year was only three years, and you can expand to five year and seven year. So you should plot this yield curve every year so that you can have a smooth issues. Please go to next. Then this is the recent, uh, this is a, a two, 2013, where the investment bond market was up to 30 years. So this one was very thin and recently it started 40 years. So depending on the maturity, yield curve will be up to certain years. And please go to next. In the bond market, demand holders are very important. And currently is only looking for investors from banks. This green one is demand by banks. And then this light green is Central Bank, Bank of Japan. The blue one is life insurance and non-life insurance. 
life insurance is a long-term savings for the people. And these are the pension funds. And this uh, red one is foreign investors. And small holders are households. So mainly banks and insurance companies were the purchaser holder of government bonds in 2013. And please go to next. However, recently the situation has been drastically changed. This part is short-term government bonds, less than one year, treasury bills. And left hand is whose maturity is longer than one year. And this is total. Since Japanese interest rate in short term is negative, and not so many people would like to hold Japanese government bonds. So Central Bank of Japan purchased it, and these are foreign investors. More than 50% of Japanese short-term government bonds are held by foreign investors because foreign investors invest into Japan from data, and all of these government bonds are yen denominated. So all the risks, exchange risks, are bared by foreign investors. But they can gain by fluctuations of the exchange rate. That's why in the short-term bond market, foreign investors are dominating. Banks hold, uh, even if negative, because of cash purposes, liquidity purposes. But in long term, uh, but Central Bank of Japan is purchasing huge amount because negative interest rate is between zero to 10 years. Central Bank of Japan is the only institution which can purchase negative interest bond. And please go to next. Next, how to set up interest rate of government bonds. Then you have to think about the demand holders. Okay, so suppose banks are holding mainly government bonds. So they have deposits, they collect deposits. Then they have to add marginal costs of their buildings operations and risks associated with holding government bonds. In case of government bonds, risks are almost zero then the interest rate they would like to ask to pay is deposit interest rate plus marginal costs of handling bonds and so on. So this is the demand uh, side of the interest rate. And of course, supply and demand determines the interest rate, but the demand holders prefer their cost of deposits plus marginal costs of handling and machine and so on. So if insurance company starts to purchase those products, then this is the payment of insurance contract and their marginal cost. This is the offered interest rate they would like to be paid. And next diagram will show the maturity structure. Once you start issue three-year bond this year, the next year it will become two-year government bond. Then third year, it will become one year government bond. So you have to have the maturity structure and also each year. And next year, you have another three year government bonds. So new issue and existing bonds. This is the diagram of the Japanese case. We have so very long term government bonds. That's why this can be drawn for 40 years. But Bhutan has to start new issue and the existing bonds and so on. This is a very important figures in future. And please go to next. And this is a JGB uh, holdings by foreign investors. As I mentioned recently, short-term government bonds are held by overseas investors a lot because it became negative interest rate. But I would like to talk about, it is very important for Bhutan to keep your demand mainly by domestic investors. That is the key for the stability of the bond market in initial development stage. And please go to next. This is the holders of Japanese government bonds by banks, city banks, banks. Banks used to hold lots of government bonds. This one is the demand by government bonds from banks. 
it used to have huge amount of government bonds, but because of negative interest rate, that their share of government bonds is declining. Please go to next. Next, I would like to talk about difference between Greece and Japan. As I mentioned, Japanese debt to GDP ratio is higher than Greece, but Greece went into bankrupt. Japan is still sustained. And this diagram will compare the two regions. Japanese case, vertical axis on the left-hand side is the issue of government bonds. If the budget deficits are increasing, government has to issue new bonds, whatever the interest rate is. So vertical axis is interest rate of government bonds. And horizontal axis is the supply and demand. The supply is vertical axis, both the Japanese case and Greece case. Right hand side, I'm showing Greece case. So Greece government bonds were increasing to the Japanese case government bonds were increasing to the right. Demand curve is upward sloping because if interest rates are higher, government uh, demand banks and other investors would like to hold more government bonds. Higher the interest rate, they would like to hold more government bonds. So demand curve is upward sloping in both cases. Japanese case, first, banks are purchasing it, and then insurance companies, pension funds, all of them are kept on purchasing it. So demand was plenty. That's why Japanese interest rates were falling down despite huge issue of government bonds. The reason is Japan had huge savings, not only banks, but insurance and pension reserves. Most recently, this green line is the purchase by Central Bank of Japan. So they issue huge amount of government bonds. Then you can see here in the bottom, interest rate becomes negative. That is happening in Japan. And on the right hand side, this is the Greece case. Greece case, I will see demand, mainly demand comes from overseas. So overseas investors are very quick to flew away from Greece bond market. We think Greece bond market is risky. Then they sell Greece bond. So demand declines. So which means demand curve shift to the rest. Purchase means demand curve shift to the right. But in Greece case, after their crisis came, many sold Greece bond and flew back to their home currency. So that is why demand has been shifting to the left. Then you can see interest rate will go up significantly. Please go to next. So Japanese case, since Central Bank of Japan is purchasing from one year to 10 years, so you can see here, negative interest rate has been achieved. Negative interest rate is possible only by Central Bank because ordinary bankers cannot buy negative interest rate bond. So because of central bank, that's why they have been kept on purchasing government bonds. Please go to next. So this uh, table will show the importance of holders of government bonds who are purchasing government bonds. This is the figure of 2011 where Greece were very close to bankruptcy. And this is the same as left-hand side in 2011. Then you can see here banks and post office, Japan has postal savings. They held 45% of total government bonds. Life insurance, non-life insurance, 20%. And public private pension funds, 14%. Central bank, 8%. Foreign investors were only 5%. Japanese case, 95% of government bonds were domestic investors. It is very important for Bhutan. You should follow Japanese experience. If you rely too much on foreign investors, then your situation will become close to Greece on the right-hand side. Greece, domestic investors, 21%. 
social pension funds, 6%, and Greece uh, domestic funds. So in total, one third, only one third are held by domestic investors. And gray parts are foreign investors. So in case of Greece, two third of investors were foreign investors. So that is why they are very quick to sell Greece bonds and went back to their home country. Japanese case, 95% were held by domestic investors. And please go to next. So when crisis came in 2010-11, this is the interest rate of Greece bond, blue one. Okay, you can see interest rate went up 35% when the crisis came because foreign investors sold Greece bond and flew away. Bottom black line is Japanese interest rate. So you can see Japanese interest rate were the lowest for many, many years. But the Greece bond interest rate went up very high. So government has to pay huge interest rates to holders. That's why Greece went into bankrupt. But Japanese case, interest rates were always low and one of the lowest in the world because domestic savings had purchased government bonds. So in Bhutan's case, when government bond is sold, you should sell it mainly to domestic investors. Otherwise, you will face with similar situation of Greece in case of some crisis. And please go to next. Next topic is fiscal sustainability. Once countries start to issue government bonds, fiscal sustainability is important. If investors feel fiscal sustainability is questionable and government may not be able to return those government bonds, then investors will not buy government bonds. So uh, this red line shows the explosion of government bond issues. So government has to issue lots of government bonds to finance their new deficits, to keep on going, and it will explode. For sustainability of the market, it will converge to lower and lower. And there's a very famous condition called Domar condition. Professor Domar, some of you might know Harold Domar. Professor Roba was a professor at MIT. I met him uh, about uh, in 1980s. And his condition of stability is very simple. Compare the interest rate and economic growth of the economy. If interest rates are higher than growth of the economy, then the budget deficits will keep on rising. So he compares interest rate and growth rate of the economy. If the rate of the economy is lower than interest rate, then uh, that will explode the situation. So growth rate has to be higher than interest rate. So this is the so-called DOMA condition. But I'm going to tell this condition only applies to United States, Greece, Japan, Bhutan. This condition does not apply. This DOMA condition is obtained only from supply of government bonds. This equation is called government budget constraint. G is general government spending, R times B, this is the interest payment of government bonds. So left-hand side is total government spending, ordinary government spending plus interest payment for government bonds. And that has to be financed in general by tax revenues. But if tax revenues are not enough, government issue, Delta BT, this is a new issue of government bonds. So this is a supply of government bonds. Then we'll obtain this DOMA condition, comparison between interest rate and growth rate of the economy. In case of United States, US has a huge amount of demand from everywhere. In case of crisis, Many people would like to buy U.S. government bonds. So United States is the only country they don't care about demand. So DOMA condition is the stability condition 
only applicable to United States, and it does not apply to Japan or Greece or Bhutan. So we have to always think about who will purchase government bonds and who will sell, government will sell. And again, DOMA condition compares interest rate and growth rate of the economy, but this only applies to United States. So we have to look at another conditions for government bonds. Please go to next. However, even now, Professor Paul Krugman, Tirol, both of them received Nobel Prize. They are all, even now they are comparing interest rate and growth rate of the economy. One of their papers, recent papers said, Japan's budget deficit has no problem because he is comparing interest rate and growth rate of the economy. If Japanese central bank will keep negative interest rate, then it is always lower than growth rate of the economy. So they said Japanese budget deficits are no problem. We can keep our sustainability, but they are not looking at demand for government bonds. So even Nobel Prize winners, they are living in the United States. So they don't understand why supply and demands are very important in bond market. So I obtain the different condition from DOMA. That is the next page. Please go to next page. So this is a paper. Uh, if you're interested in, I can send it to you. And please go to next. I apologize, this is a very uh, sophisticated uh, equation. But uh, once we look at demand for government bonds, that is the first law. And second one is supply of government bonds, including the purchase of central bank. So central bank purchases government bonds, and this is the marketable interest rate in the government bonds. So delta B is market supply of government bonds subtracting central bank. And then BD is market demand. And then stability condition will become the bottom of the equation. And, and numerator is how much government bonds the country has issued. Then denominator is the interest rate sensitivity of demand. When the interest rate changes, how much domestic investors can buy government bonds? And if interest rate goes up, interest payment will become bigger and bigger. So this is a supply side. So again, the supply demand by divide, divided by demand, this is the new condition which is applicable to Japan, Greece, Bhutan, and all the countries except for United States. So in Bhutan's case, when you think about sustainability of the budget, you have to look at my condition rather than uh, Professor Doma's condition. Please go to next. And if some of you are interested in all the uh, detailed discussions are written in our discussion paper, and also policy issues will forthcoming to Global Solutions Journal from Europe. So if you're interested in, I'll send those papers. Next. My uh, proposed condition is we have, to look at, we have to look at supply and demand. So I applied my equation to Japan and Greece. If this blue line exceeds red line, that is instability unstable, budget is not sustainable. As you can see here, Greece case, there are two points where the government bond market is unstable and exploding. So this is a case where Greece went into bankrupt. In Japanese case, it is always sustainable. Main reason is demand for government bonds are existing. And Greece case, demand of the investors from overseas started to flew away from Greece. So that went into bankrupt. So again, the demand and supply are very important. And please go to next. And as I mentioned, that the Japanese case, our negative interest rate has been pursuing. In Japan, the central bank has a open market operation. Central bank purchases government bonds and then issue money supply. So Bhutan's case, 
in future, central bank will start purchasing government bonds and supplying your money into the market. Then the purchase of the government bonds is not only banks or insurance company, but it may come from central bank. However, central bank money supply has to be independently controlled. Otherwise, future inflation will come out. But the important point is you have to always think about government bond will not only be purchased by banks, insurance companies, but central bank will also purchase government bonds. But that amount has to be independently determined by the central bank of monetary policy. Once government force central bank to purchase government bonds, that will create future inflation. So central bank monetary policy has to be always independent from fiscal situation. That is another key. And please go to next. And Japanese bad government bonds has to have, has been issued a lot. And this is social uh, security. That is about 34.9% of total government spending. So aging population made Japanese spending of the budget becomes bigger and bigger. That created the huge budget deficits. But because of plenty of demand by high savings in Japan, we are still sustained up to now. Next topic, please go to next, is the SDG, Sustainable Development, and Green Bond. So from now, I'm going to explain about my paper, Financial Research Letters. And please go to next. Green bond is very important. However, current definition of green bond in Europe, and they have 10 different criteria for green bond principles. Please go to next. Suppose green bond, uh, renewable energy, solar power, and wind power, they issue green bond they can issue green bond to finance their uh, renewable energy. And another one is some building who is very energy efficiency. They can issue green bond. But as you can see here, some of the building is 70% CO2 cut and 30% may be green. Another building, 80% green, 20% gray. So if you can see these 10 criteria, it is not strictly 100% green. So there are lots of different issues could be possible. 70% green, 30% gray, 90% green, 10% gray. All of them can be included one of 10 criteria so we can issue green bond. So that may not be so good in currently. And please go to next. Traditionally, investors are looking at rate of return and risk. Now, ESG, environmental, uh, sustainable uh, growth, those are very important point. However, current ESG definitions are also not so clear about greenness index. And this next page, and this is a portfolio analysis for investors. Suppose there are two stocks, A and B, then they will maximize their rate of return and risk. Point E will become their portfolio investment. And please go to next. However, point E now will change to point F. Left-hand side is ESG score. Suppose there are two companies, A and B, and B has higher score for ESG, then investors will change their portfolio and much more investment to toward B stock rather than A stock. So point F will be their investment. When investors take into account of ESG or greenness as one of the component. However, another consulting company defines ESG score differently like blue line. Then based on this 
another consulting company, best portfolio allocation will become G. So in other words, depending on the evaluating consulting firms, the point of a ESG is different one to another. That means portfolio allocation will be distorted depending on which consulting criteria you use. So please go to next. This is the results of uh, how much portfolio allocation will be different from one consulting company to another. And you can see here, depending on which consulting company you use, portfolio allocation will be different, sometimes 74% to co company A, and sometimes 54% to company A, because their definitions and scores of ESGs are different. So in other words, current situation of ESG or greenness, it is not unified. So I think it is very important to have some unified and taxonomies. Then how could we resolve it? Please go to next. One way is global taxation on CO2 plastics to all over the world, same tax rate. And all the company has to pay same uh, ratio of tax revenues if their CO2s are very large. And please go to next. Then the rate of return will be changed. This is the taxation on CO2 and NOx. And please go to next. And if tax is charged to all the companies in the world, then their rate of return will be changed. And after tax, then portfolio frontier will become dotted line. Then investors can come back to rate of return and risk. They don't have to consider greenness or ESG because tax is already looking at the component of ESG or greenness. Because if the company exposes so much CO2, then their tax rate becomes higher. So their point of this return goes down. Then after tax return is this dotted line. Then investors do not have to worry about greenness or ESG because it is automatically reduced by tax and the return for the investors uh, will be changed. So one, one way is charge tax to all over the world, same tax rate to CO2, same tax rate to plastic, same tax rate to NOx and so on. So this is one of the solutions. However, taxing to all over the world is very difficult. Then another one is next page. Next page is green credit rating based on how much CO2 is exposed, NOx is exposed, plastic is exposed. Then they should have clear criteria and single green credit rating. And that is another solution. However, currently Europe has different definition. China has different definition. Then again, the distortion will come out. And please go to next. And green bond market, US is very large. Japan is very small because I'm talking about current definition of greenness and green bond is not unique. Some company has 80% green, 20% green, gray. They issue a green bond. And 60% green, 40% gray. They can only issue green bond. That is why I'm often talk about in Japan, we should not issue green bond until unified definition of the world can be established. Otherwise, it will distort the green bond market. And please go to next. However, in Europe, despite these problems, they are issuing lots of green bond. Sweden's case, they are mainly issuing for banks. And Denmark is issuing longer term. This is mainly for pension funds and uh, in, in insurance. So depending on the country, a green bond is depending to who they are going to issue. The maturity is different. And next page, and last two points, green 
is often discussed in the same context, but it all also applies the same uh, argument. Some green bank, green loan is 80% green. Some green loan, 70% green, but they are all saying this is green banking. So this is again distort the portfolio allocation. And last two points, and next, next page, green central banking. Uh, Ma, uh, Governor Marvin King, former Governor Marvin King is talking about central bank should also look at green bond. But as I said, green bond is not unified definition. So some of the green bond is purely green, some of the green bond, lots of gray, but uh, it could be possible. So this would again distort the bond market. Last point uh, is, please go to next. Stock price and uh, ESG investment. There are two argument, ESG investment will increase stock price. And another uh, argument is ESG investment is not necessarily increase stock price. This is a result when we look at the performance of the stock price and ESG investment. Only in this uh, uh, criteria based on, this is a criteria by agency B, then this is parallel. So ESG investment and stock prices are correlating each other. But based on other uh, criteria of another consulting agency, then stock price and ESG investments are not correlated at all. Why it happens, please go to next page. And there are two reasons, I think. One is many companies, many countries are now looking for ESG investment and they want to achieve some target of ESG investment. So currently it is a gradual process of increasing ESG investment in stock market. So as long as this ESG investment continues, then stock price will rise. So in other words, ESG investment and stock price will go parallel up until the certain level of ESG investment. After this point is achieved, then many investors will come back. We have to look at rate of return and risk. Then the stock market will fluctuate as before. So I think some of the uh, stocks looks like correlation, positive correlation with ESG investment, but that is only the process until this ESG target will be achieved. And next panel, I, I'll, okay. Then lastly, policy recommendations. So summing up of my presentation, first one is coupon rate, interest rate. Interest rate should be deposit rate of interest plus marginal cost of the bank to handling government bonds and risk premium. And usually government bond case, risk premium is equal to zero. So coupon rate is deposit interest rate plus marginal cost. Then secondly, I propose Bhutan government should BTN denominated bonds rather than DARA denominated bonds. Because DARA denominated bonds, Bhutan government has to carry exchange rate risk. And that is not good because foreign investors prefer to buy data denominated bonds, then our Ministry of Finance has to pay all those exchange rate risks to overseas investors. So I would like to propose uh, BTN denominated uh, bonds. And thirdly, domestic savings are important. Currently, Bhutan bank deposits are only demand to government bonds. But insurance, long-term savings has to be developed and pension funds, private and the public should be developed. Then number four, initial year and several years, uh, development of primary market is very important. And you will ask banks to hold three years and until maturity. And so that is a primary market. Then gradually you can start secondary market. And first initial few years, I would like to recommend you should look at long-term investors until maturity rather than selling and buying. 
So secondary market should be developed after several years of issue of primary um, government bonds. Lastly, is a relation between money market and yield curve. Central bank in Bhutan is controlling short-term money market. So that is a short-term interest rate. Then longer-term interest rate has some uh, risk premium and term premium and judged from those demand. So I think short-term bond market, short-term government bonds, which will be the same as money market rate, should be based on central bank's monetary policy. Then you can draw the yield curve, which I have shown in Japanese experience. And later on, central bank starts purchasing government bonds as an open market operation and monetary policy will gradually change to open market operations like in developing country, developed countries. So those are my presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Yoshino. Thank you for you know the very insightful uh, uh, presentation. I, I have some comment, you know, the, the of course, you know, the positive comment. But uh, I would like to invite the uh, you know the, the uh, questions from the floors. Now we have about you know 15 minutes. 15 minutes to go to the next session. And uh, the other first you know, question, we already received one question from the uh, Lin Chou, Lin Zhou. Yeah, I think uh, you know the Lin, right? Lin is our colleague, you know. From SK, but uh, she wrote the uh, uh, question, you know, the, in the uh, chat, right? So, uh, uh, Professor, her, her question is that, like this, why, why are more foreign investors holding Japanese short-term bills, key bills, you know, with negative interest rate again? Professor mentioned, uh, Professor Yoshino mentioned that it was for speculation of exchange rate. Then why can't foreign investors hold cash, you know? In N instead of the uh, T bill, the only treasury bill, short term bill. You know? That is a uh, hard, hard question. I see. Okay. Uh, okay. Foreign investors has to buy something when they invest into Japan. If they bring cash, okay, nobody will hold cash within Japan. So foreign investors has to buy something and it is a short term. So short term, only treasury bills are available and it is most liquid and anytime they can sell. So it is in a sense, they are just bringing cash into Japan, but bringing cash, they have to buy something because they cannot bring just cash in the street. So that is why they are purchasing a treasury bills. So it is the same thing as they are bringing cash into Japan. Okay. Yeah, now, you know, the, I would like to open the floor to everybody. Uh, do you have a, you know, the, any, you know, the, the question yeah, to share with us? I'm the asking the Professor Yoshino, you know, the, please don't hesitate, you know, the, the ask any questions you have. So, uh, you know, the floor is yours to everybody. A anybody want to speak up? Any questions? Uh, I think uh, uh, I, I see, you know, the Doji. Doji, you have a question, right? Uh, yeah, you know, the Doji. Doji, you have a, you know, the, the floor is yours. Please speak up. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your elaborate uh, presentation. Mine is confined to our domestic uh, economy. Uh, in the absence of a yield curve, uh, how would a central bank uh, determine a policy rate? If you could give share some of your insights on that. Okay. I think uh, since you don't have any yield curve, you only have three year, one point this year. Then any kind of yield curve could be possible, but uh, it is based on term premium. So currently this year, Bhutan government issued three year government bond. And then short term interest rate is here. And then usually this is called a term premium, short term versus three years. And that will be 
the discounted discounted value of your uh, interest rate. So I can give you the formula how to set up your short term interest rate compared to this long term. And short term is our how how long will your short term? Three months? Six months? Dorji? Is as, your short term bond, as bond such, market? Uh, just now, uh, especially on the Treasury bill, uh, uh, it's based on uh, the uh, bidding starts on the yield. So not necessarily it reflects uh, the uh, actual uh, rate. So as just now, short term would be three months. A three months, OK. Then and then below, month, yes. Yeah. Three and months, uh, for three years. Sure. Okay. sure. Yeah, so that should be two, two components. One is uh, uh, term premium, three years versus three months. Okay, that is one component. Another one is risks, which include the government risk, which will be almost zero, and then liquidity risk, liquidity premiums. So there are two components. One is uh, term premium and liquidity premium, and then risks. So those are the three additional component. And I'll give you the formula later on, OK? Sure, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor, Doji, uh, uh, you know, the very close, you know, the close friend to us, you know, the SCAP. He's a CEO of the uh, uh, Royal Security, you know, exchange, you know, the, the yeah, authority of uh, Bhutan. Thank, thank you, Doji. And now, you know, the, we got the another question through the uh, chat, you know, and uh, I'm going to, first, I'm going to leave the uh, next question in the chat. Uh, you know, the, from uh, Dasan Namgei, you know, the Bank of Bhutan, Bank of, I, you know, Bank of Bhutan, right? Uh, his question, his or her question, uh, maybe he, you know, the question is uh, like this. Fixing a coupon rate based on deposit rate and the marginal cost will be more costly for bond as deposit market in Bhutan is very high. How do you regulate the rate? Or well, normally the, the thematic bond are of low cost? So this is a, the, you know, the, the question. Okay. Yes, thank you very much for the question. And I'm, uh, I'm talking about that, uh, that is a demand, that, that interest rate, uh, coupon rate is equal to deposit rate plus marginal cost of the bank plus uh, risk premium. This is coming from demand side of the uh, interest rate. But the supply side of the interest rate is different. So the market should determine the interest rate. So demand curve is based on that interest rate, which I have shown. So I think that in principle, uh, bond market should be determined by uh, supply and demand. Next, uh, should interest rate be lower than uh, deposit rate of interest, okay? If banks are the major holder of government bond, then government has to pay higher interest rate. But if the deposit maturity is six months or one year, then government bond is three years. Then there's a term premium. So government bond interest rate has to be higher than one year deposit. That is the intermediary role of the commercial banks. So term structure is different. And banks are holding three year government bonds that has term premium compared to one year of deposits. Then government bonds rate can be higher than one year deposits. So those are my two of my points. And the professor, another point, you know, that you know, that he mentioned that that is that you know, the, the coupon rate of a thematic bond, green bond or social bond, you know, whatever bond, right? You know, that we have the impression that cost of the you know the thematic bond is lower than the general plain banana, sorry, ba vanilla, you know, sorry, <laughs> so plain vanilla, you know, the bond, you know, that is that the, the, the another another question he he raised. Okay, uh, I think government bonds should be the lowest compared to other corporate bonds because government is the safest issuer compared to corporations. 
if some of the corporations, their safety is as good as government bonds, then their corporate bond should be very close to government bonds. And there are two or three factors. It is the maturity, how many years the government bond, a three-year government bond or five-year government bond, two-year government bond. So that is term premium. That is one difference. Second one is liquidity in the market. Usually government bonds has the most liquid market. If we want to sell, you can sell. Then the liquidity of the government bond is lower. And last one is uh, risks of the government is lower. That's why in many developed countries, government bond is the lowest. But in this case, you issued only three-year bond this year. So uh, liquidity market, secondary market is not yet developed. That's why the bond interest rate will be uh, slightly higher than the deposit rate of interest. But as the bond market will become much more fluent and flexible and liquid, then government bonds should pay the lowest interest rate compared to private corporate bonds. So it doesn't really, you know, that uh, depending on the, the type of the bond, right? If, you know, the one, you know, same government issues, they are, you know, the different type of the bond, like a green bond and the normal ordinary bond. So interest rate shouldn't be, you know, different. Professor, that's, no, that's no, uh, I don't think it, it should be different. No. I see. Okay. 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 Good. Thank you so much. So, uh, uh, you know, the, we just got the another question from the uh, Lada, uh, Lada Om, right? Lada Om. You know, the, the question is uh, the, the accordingly. During the period, you know, pe period of falling interest rate, are long-term bonds recommended over short-term bond? Mm -hmm. And the historical, historical data shows long-term bonds outperform perform short-term bond mm. in, low interest, in low interest environment. Yeah. So, you know, that, 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 that uh, you know, that, that, you know, uh, the different, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, the long-term and the short-term bond. Yeah. When the central bank suddenly lowered interest rate, then it is called the reverse yield curve. Usually yield curve is upward sloping, but when the, uh, the central bank increases interest rate suddenly, then that yield curve becomes downward sloping. That is a reverse uh, sloping yield curve. It often happens when the central bank suddenly changed its monetary policy. Yeah. Okay. okay. So any other questions? Now we already, you know, the, the professor already, you know, the react to response to the all questions so far. Uh, still, right, we have a, uh, you know, the time, and we could take the, uh, the, the a couple, you know, additional question if you have. Uh, anybody want to ask is there any questions? Yeah, still, you know, that you have a, uh, you know, that everybody, everybody, everybody has a floor. So I, I see none. So Professor, you know, the maybe, you know, the, the now, you know, the we be, better to conclude the, this session. But before that, I just want to share the, my, you know, the observation, personal observation, right? As, as usual, right? As usual, I really enjoyed, Professor, you are, you know, the, the, the lecture and the, the presentation. And, uh, you know, the, the, I've been, right? I've been, you know, the, the studying and also working, writing, you know, the papers, you know, dealing with the, uh, the excellent, you know, the, the economists and the scholars so far. But always one thing I found is that, right, that those, you know, the, the good scholars always present the, uh, his or her idea very clearly, very easily, even though, you know, that the, by reading, right, on paper, you know, talking about the, uh, you know, the a bit complicated issues with the very sophisticated, you know, the equation, mathematics. But uh, by listening, listening to uh, your presentation, I think a message is very clear to me. But uh, you know the issue is that you know the the, the, the you know the, you know the, the you know many information is so you know the rich. So I you know want to suggest is that maybe more occasion to have the, this kind of the uh, you know the, your presentation and lecturing in the future for the uh, Bhutan and also other countries. That's uh, my, my, you know, the message to, you know, the professor. And uh, maybe, you know, the, the message to the uh, all the audience today. I think uh, we have a very good, you know, the, uh, 
uh, you know, the kind of uh, occasion to listen to the, such an insightful presentation from the one of the uh, the leading scholar on the uh, bond market and also other economic issues in the world and in Japan and uh, Asia and in the world. Okay. Having said so, I would like to, you know, that, 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 that close, close, you know, close, I, do, I would like to close this session by, you know, the giving the uh, maybe big hand to Professor, Professor Yoshino. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Yoshino. Yeah. So now I'd like to close, you know, that this, you know, the session one and, uh, the, the, you know, returning the floor to the uh, Kun Patera. I to move to the, uh, the second session. Yeah, th thank you so much. Thank you to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So we now move to session two. I would like to welcome again Dr. Tentip as the moderator of the session, session two on optimal financial terms for green bonds. Dr. Tentip, please. Um. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Pachara, and of course, um, thank you very much also, um, Professor Yoshino, for uh, your insightful presentations, and I've learned a lot uh, today, and it gives me a good uh, comprehensive overview of um, both the theoretical and practical aspects of bond market um, in, in Japan and how we can use them for uh, Putan's uh, case. So we'll now, uh, given that Professor Shino has set the stage for um, for this uh, meeting, I would like to now uh, move on to the next session, which is optimal financial terms for green bonds. My name is Tian Tip Supanit, Chief of Financing for Development at UNSCAP, and I'll be moderating this session. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we all know that green social and thematic bonds are fixed income financial instruments issued with the aim of addressing climate change and facilitating environmental and social solutions. I'd like to say that there's a very encouraging trend for these innovative financial instruments um, over the past uh, several years. The green bond market in particular has reached a record high in 2019. Although still a small fraction of the overall bond market, they are increasingly attracting investors' attention who care about the long-term sustainability and the environment. Despite the encouraging trends on these instruments and willingness by both investors and several governments to engage in the green bond market, I'd like to say that the devil is in the detail. As we know, issuing a bond, and particularly a green bond, is a complex process which issuers must follow to comply with the various requirements of global or local institutional investors. These sessions will provide some guidance on the issuance of such bonds, and we are honored to have with us today Professor Louis Cheung, who will speak on optimal financial terms for green bonds. Before I hand over um, the virtual microphone to Dr. Chang, I'd like to introduce um, his, uh, him. Um, Dr. Chung is a professor of finance and director of Center for Economic Sustainability and Entrepreneurial Finance at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Uh, before joining PolyU, he was an associate professor of finance at Murray State University in Kentucky. He is another renowned scholar who has more than 90 articles published in refereed journals, including the Journal of Finance. Uh, he has also been a, a very good friend uh, for a, a while uh, through our SCAP Sustainable Business Network and has been helping us with the climate finance work, green bond ESG with UN SCAP. So Dr. Cheung, with that introduction, and I would like to hand over the virtual microphone to you, and you now have the floor. Dr. Cheung, please. Thank you, Tian. Really, really my pleasure to be here today. And I see you have your... Uh, curtain open in Bangkok, it's a clear sky. So I would like to first say that uh, thank you for the finance secretary, Mr. Dajo Doji, that have, the, remember about 11 months ago, we visited uh, Timbu and we were there for five days and learned a lot about Bhutan and other great uh, Bhutan uh, government officials and, and Doji from the uh, World Stock Exchange. And now, that we are at the second stage of our discussion based upon what we learned from Bhutan last year 
And now we have uh, Professor um, uh, Yoshino. Yeah, I gave a great introduction on how we can compare with Japan, that we should learn about the bond issue, a lot of insights about what we can do in terms of structuring the deal. And a lot of things I agree with him about a very important secondary market, transparency, where you need to have a clear record of everything showing the investors. I made this agree a little bit with uh, the speech about we have to sell to domestic investor, you sell to international investor, the country may go bankrupt. I'll take that reservation and discuss that a little bit when we have more time on the Q&A section so that when Tian can bring that up again, that we can discuss that have a, a different point of view about what Bhutan needs at this stage of economic development and with this century where we have a more sophisticated international financial market compared uh, 35, 50 years ago when Japan was developing a similar stage. Now, before I go on for my presentation verbally by myself, I would like you, uh, uh, the uh, host, uh, Pat, to show a voice over PPT that I prepare for this particular occasion. Instead of hearing me to talk about something, let's hear about the introduction by voice over PPT. Let's begin. Do you hear any sound?
Thank you. This is the end of the introduction presentation, which allow us to learn about what we have actually covered a year ago. And also we talk about how this green bond markets develop, which is echo back to uh, Professor Yoshino's uh, presentation about the green bond market as well. Now, 
Let's talk about my presentation. And Pat, can you upload my presentation now? Thank you. So this is the picture I took last time in December when I visited uh, Bhutan. The tiger nest is a wonder. And uh, I took thousands of pictures and I put this up to show that we love Bhutan. And it's always clear sky. And this is why we go for the next stage. I think if you look at the title of this presentation, it is about the optimal financial terms for green bonds. Now, green bonds here is being used in a more general sense. It may not be just purely green. It could be so-so. It could be sustainability. So we just use the word green so that people can capture their attention. But the application, the use of process, as I mentioned in the uh, PowerPoint a moment ago, can be for COVID-19 can be for social response. Next. Uh, the presentation here is relatively shorter, and I have about six different parts. And this is all about my conclusion and full out from the last year since I visited Bhutan with the team at PolyU and UNS Gap team. And then when we came back, I have talked to several investment bankers different companies, financial advisors, credit rating agency, and gather the opinion from what they think about, particularly for Bhutan. So this is not a general discussion here. I focus my information here, mostly application to the case of Bhutan as the information I have received. Of course, some of the information here may be older because as a finance secretary, Mr. Dajo Doji mentioned that you have recently, just a few days ago, engaged in European Investment Bank. So there are new development every day here involving the government financing and towards the, the green and sustainability. So if the information that uh, we have here is a little bit out of date, please accept my apology in advance. Next. Now, this is something that I believe that we already mentioned in the last year, December. Basically, and the uh, world uh, government of Bhutan has using funding, have been using funding through uh, borrowing and issues of treasury bills and short-term loans. And I found a very interesting uh, table from uh, Professor uh, Yosino's presentation in the resource material. It shows that in the paper here, I just read it out loud. The uh, three month to six months interest rate is about 5%, all the way to uh, up is about 9%, 8%. And so, therefore, if you look at the reason for that the issue by the uh, 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 Bhutan government, and the last page there here, and uh, last statement here on September 4th that uh, was announced a call for subscription for the three year bond is about USD $40 million. And unfortunately, my bar is blocking my uh, view, and I'm hoping that I can resolve that very soon, Jesse. And here, I know I believe that the coupon rate is 6.5%, but what happened here is we actually have to pay a little bit higher interest rate for a three-year bond. Now, this is one of the things that I need to uh, make qualification about the viewpoint from uh, Professor Yashino versus mine. The domestic interest rate at Bhutan is relatively high to me. A global recession and low interest rate environment in the US and Japan is negative interest rate and porn one, two, three, four, five percent interest rate, very low interest rate. Paying 6.5 is really, really high. So because the very different interest rate environment that Bhutan is facing now, the potential to use the international market to attract international investors to provide liquidity using an even lower interest rate that I discussed in the next few pages later on can be a great opportunity for Bhutan government to consider. So this is the, the backdrop. Next page, please. 
Okay, so the uh, proposing uh, term that I talked to uh, different companies, I believe that they don't mind I disclose their names. I have submitted my report to UNSCAP. I believe that I talked to HSBC, Credit Suisse, Credit Agricole to understand other banks, several other banks, um, UBS, and um, I talked to them and understand how if a, a small country like Bhutan with their economic status will issue a bond, what kind of a fund size that they will entertain in the international market and what kind of coupon rate. And this information here is actually older because that was way before, it's early uh, 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 last year. So with now, the interest rate can be actually lower. So they were saying about 100 million USD for a combination of so-so and green bond cluster. And if you reach 200 million USD, that will be actually very internationalized in terms of all the listing procedure, credit rating procedure, and also the uh, bond verification for second party or the uh, third party certification like uh, CBI kind of thing will be all there. Then, because of that certification, the international recognition, the coupon rate can be five to six percent, can be below five percent actually. When in the current environment, the COVID nineteen dividend that uh, uh, Abisa mentioned. So therefore, it's important that we go through the motion to think about how to build the international participation. Not say overwhelmingly, but certainly some participation will address the issue that last December we talked about the lack of trading, especially from figures provided by the Royal Stock Exchange in Bhutan. Very little trading turnover activities for stocks and bonds. Most uh, investor domestic, they will hold the bond, hold the deposit to maturity. Because of that, it's lack of liquidity without a international stimulus without certain change of market mechanism, it's difficult to induce liquidity from domestic traders. Next. So we talked about last year that actually you can hydropower is a great example that you have a small uh, hydropower that you can use it for part of the asset for the process to expand or to maintain under the green label. And of course, the label cost sustainability is also there for the social portion. And in the pages, we have the example from Korea, which actually South Korea. And actually, you can see how they structured that deal. And therefore, uh, I talked to Credit Suisse, and they're very nice. They have a, a pretty good size uh, uh, advisor. They call it structuring advisor. So this is not the iBanker. This is not the underwriter division. This is a structuring, structuring advisor of a credit aggregate. They help Hong Kong to issue the green bond. They help uh, 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 China to negotiate with AIB to help them to flow the green bond. So they're very uh, experienced people. And they suggested that uh, you don't need a third party certification. I remember last time that when the, my uh, research associate, Hauman, came to Bhutan, they, he talked about for 45 minutes the detail of the green bond certification using CBI model. And some of the Bhutanese government officials were uh, uh, nervous. They said that, wow, this is very difficult to meet all the standard, all the detailed information to do the due diligence and things like that. And after that experience, I came back and talked to uh, different people. And they said that nowadays, the second party verification will be good enough. And that will be more flexible. You still get the reputation internationally without the rigid definition of to go to a process, what project could be green, what project cannot be green as dictated by the CBI framework. Okay, next. And the term that we are talking about here is a three year to five year bond, five to six percent as originally I mentioned. But now we talk about under COVID-19, uh, things are different now. And under the umbrella of COVID-19 social response fund, we have this uh, well-known bond structure advisor to tell you, to help you to structure the bond for projects, underlying asset. We believe that optimistically, the interest rate can be four to 5% or even lower. I don't want to say too low because if I cannot do it, or you cannot do it, 
I don't want to be liable. So therefore, this is still on the higher end. And documentation from the previous smaller country that issue listed in London and also the other uh, agency bank, the interest rate is much lower. So we are comfortable that actually with time with the uh, uh, standing could be considered. This is a, a very comfortable coupon rate, which save 1.5% to 2.5% interest rate if we issue domestically. And that interest saving as Professor Yashino mentioned, will release the burden of a strengthening or increasing budget deficit because you pay a lot more interest if you have to issue in the domestic manner. Okay, And of course, the challenge that last time in December in the conference was the discussion on currency denomination, whether it should be USD or rupiah or domestic or Bhutanese currency. Now, the issue is because the uh, Bhutanese local currency is not are convertible to international. So therefore it's not possible for international to buy that. So the only consideration will be in the rupee or USD. Of course, I'm not gonna get into a heated discussion. What is the risk about exchange rate risk, about problem of paying back a different currency. And all this can be partially adjusted by using some hedge in the near term and also using some prediction of current valuation. So therefore, it's not like a, a huge risk at this point of time. Of course, three to five years term is not. 10 years is a different story. So we're talking about three to five year term. Currency risk is there. I have to say it's there. And it's a huge. Most international investors don't think so. Okay, From the perspective of the role of government Bhutan, not from the international perspective, even from the domestic perspective, but perspective, we believe that the currency risk is manageable. Okay. Next, please. Now uh, we are coming to the uh, second half or final stage of my presentation, and therefore we need some milestone. Last time we talked about a, 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 a timeline when uh, Bhutan should consider taking action to move towards the green bond consideration. Of course. We congratulate uh, a, a few weeks ago that Bhutan issued the first uh, uh, sovereign bond, and which is the $40 million bond, which is very successful, 300% uh, uh, oversubscribed. And that's a great uh, recognition from the demand side of the bond. So let's look at what are the infrastructure and what are the uh, deficit, deficit, uh, deficit financing that uh, relate to green and so so. Uh, related issues that Bhutan has and consider a consecutive uh, green or social, social bond in the making for the next year. I think that will be something that couldn't be considered based upon the demand you have now domestically. Okay, next. So one side issue, not exactly is about the financial terms, but based upon the previous research I had with the other paper related to Bhutan, uh, we acknowledge that the design of appropriate allotment system will be important, meaning that if the allotment system is tailor-made to the demand of the international and the domestic investor, and you will be oversubscribed. So therefore, the question I consider guaranteeing the bond under state budget, Bhutan government will have a dedicated web page to list in all the financial data, the transaction, the liquidity, and the issuance of the bonds so that international and domestic investors can see things clearly. Transparency is very important to promote liquidity. And of course, the market making system for the trading and the secondary market is extremely important, which I believe that we touched base a little bit last time when we had the discussion in last December with the team from the uh, Royal Stock Exchange. I'm sure that Dr. Sign can talk about it a little bit more and update later on when we have Q&A section time. We should have a lot more time on Q&A for my part. Next. So now the final setting here will be the opinion from the bond structuring advisor and the rating agency. And I took the privilege to talk to these rating agencies and also the uh, uh, credit aggregate uh, other bond structuring advisor and they do not do the book running. Of course they can, 
but uh, their role here is to just advise how to structure the bond to meet international investors' appetite. And in that regard, number two point here that we talked about the South Korean case a moment ago, and they issue a green and sustainability bond, and they have 90% green, which I believe they went for CPI certification. And the interesting thing is, even though South Korea government does not really need it, but they test the water by using 10% component on social bonds. And this 10% social bonds, because there's no rigid or common framework, to certify what is a social bond. So it's, they went through a, a second party opinion from uh, uh, with the, I believe, uh, credit, uh, credit agrico and the credit agency, and they declared that 90% green and 10% social bond. It's a combination. It went out very successfully. So therefore, that is something that uh, Bhutan can consider. When you issue green bond, it doesn't have to be all green as a strictly defined. Nowadays, COVID-19 involve hospitals, involve infrastructure to help the underprivileged, the ESG concept, not just the E. There's a lot of S there. Uh, poverty, uh, disparity in, 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 the, in the country, all this can be part of the S, and that could be also funded under the umbrella of the social. So to me, that is something that certainly a little bit more creative, but certainly it's not like you will be the first a country to do it. The other country has also tried that, especially under COVID-19. I believe that I uh, read the newspaper a little bit. Uh, I believe that one of the agency banks has given some grant or loan to Bhutan to fight COVID-19. So that will be something similar in the nature. It's not green, but certainly is important for uh, sustainable development. Next. So I believe that the last point I want to make here is the last point that, uh, of course, this is at the end of 2020. I do not know if the Singapore government, the MAS, will actually extend this uh, special discount. So there were a uh, package that offered by the Singapore Stock Exchange that if you structure do the underwriting work with the branch in Singapore, no matter what international branch, could be other branch in other company, the holding company, HSBC, or maybe Credit Suisse, maybe it's another bank, but as long as their branch office in Singapore location handle at least 50% of the work, they will waive the bond issue waiting fee and some of the listing fee. And that will help to save a lot of money by listing there. Now, of course, being a, a person from Hong Kong and, and teaches at university in one of the Hong Kong university, uh, I should have found something from the Hong Kong government to promote that for the stock exchange. But unfortunately, the Hong Kong stock exchange, as far as I know, does not have such a good package. So therefore, for the benefit of uh, Bhutan, Singapore could be a consideration if you do want to do that. Next. So in conclusion, I believe that uh, a, a timeline with the, the milestone should be initiated and think about the tough question. Now, even though I said that the uh, <clears throat> finance secretary should consider strongly about the international component. Now, if you say that we are more comfortable issuing a green bond, a social response bond with only domestic, would that be a good idea? Of course, yes, because you start from zero, then you have a green component to educate your investor for long term. Education, investor education is important for domestic investor for creating secondary market liquidity. So even though you start with domestic and a small tranche for international, for some famous uh, commercial banks or I banks to take over that, with certain way to hash that particular smaller tranche for the currency risk, so that you combine a combination of a domestic and international issue. That could be something that I consider as well. I think to me, the point here is to take action. Taking action at COVID-19 is a good time for people to be aware of the need internationally and the good work done in Bhutan through the E and S and G and through the social response to COVID-19. Thank you. That ends my presentation.
Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lewis, for um, insightful and uh, practical uh, presentations uh, from what you have discussed with all these banks and credit rating agency. Uh, we appreciate that. Now, um, actually, um, since actually we have quite a bit of time, um, probably 50 minutes for discussion, so I think uh, we, we would welcome all the questions from audience or comments um, on these uh, both of your presentations and Professor Yoshino presentation because as you can all see right um, Professor Yoshino has a very uh, usefully presented the case of Japan where you know um, recently despite the very high public debt um, despite a very um, large government bond issuance, no crisis has ever happened in Japan um, compared to other market with more open capital market, more open to foreign institutional investors. At the same time, we also have a situation um, where actually at the UNSCAP we've been uh, talking to governments and one thing that they ask is, like, is that, wow, why do we issue bonds? <laughs> And it costs so much, right? Uh, if we can get other other source of funding, so uh, it is important to consider all options uh, to you know consider between financial stability side of issuing bonds and also the cost savings. So I think both Professor Yoshino and uh, Professor Lewis have presented their views on pros and cons of um, each each um, options. Um, either the uh, to issue traditional bonds based on domestic markets or to pursue more uh, green social sustainability bonds in the international market. So I just want to uh, summarize Professor Lewis also before we, we move on to, to the questions. So Professor Lewis has uh, presented the case uh, for Bhutan and he has uh, summarized that perhaps the amount of issuance, uh, the green and social bonds based on these uh, conversation with bankers um, is that about 100 to 200 million bonds. We have already seen that Bhutan has issued about 40, 50 million US dollars in the past. He mentioned also that the 5 to 6 percent uh, uh, coupon is possible and factoring all the costs and that all these banks are willing to uh, compare all the and reduce the, 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 the fee for, for Bhutan. He also mentioned that the second party opinion is probably already adequate without going through this sophistication or complex process of verification. Um, he mentioned that although, of course, exchange rate plays an important role in you know, providing some risk if issuing internationally, but those exchange rate can be managed and factor in given that if you don't issue to uh, long term bonds, uh, like three to five years should be OK to incorporate those exchange rate risks. And he also mentioned about the very important allotment system and transparency. And he also proposed the fact that from the green bond, we can also think about other thematic bonds like a social bond, social factors, which other countries have issued, for example, uh, Korea. So those are the kind of thing that I uh, gather from his presentation. Also would like to apologize earlier that some participants cannot hear your a, a beautiful voice over the PPT. <laughs> we will, we will, because this, um, this it will be recorded, so we will share um, the recording later, so you can always uh, listen to it at, at, at your own time. I've got only one question in the chat box so far, which is from Bank of Bhutan, uh, from Da Sang Nam Ge, which is a very interesting question, and actually is the kind of questions that I, I thought about earlier. So thank you so much for asking this. Um, you mentioned that despite offering high interest rate on deposit by banks, people still subscribe to the recent government bond, which is issued at 6.5% coupon rate. Why is it so? So I guess um, he's trying to ask, you know, why does still demand for recent government bond despite the fact that it doesn't offer you know, much different or probably even lower than the bank deposits? I think I this is a pretty challenging question. Uh, just like the uh, negative interest rate question, the uh, negative TBO rate question that asked in the previous section. Now, I, I don't have a behavioral uh, survey done on Bhutanese investors to understand why they take a lower return investment. Now, I do not also cannot say that the uh, education level of the investor 
what are they thinking based upon what they learn. But from a Western culture, okay, if we talk about uh, Professor Yoshino's uh, uh, question, there are certain structure for a portfolio that we have to put in place in terms of investment. And maybe saving rate, deposit rate in a bank is higher, but maybe their term is different. Three years, five years, I don't think they have, maybe they're not in love there. And buying government bond and allow certain advantage because if you look at the trading or the uh, pledging or in terms of the allocation of your money, according to Western knowledge, there's always a short term portion, 10% on short term, uh, medium term, maybe three to five years bond, maybe 20% and stocks and things like that. And if you have a lot of money because the lack of investment choices in Bhutan, where I believe that last time, I believe that the uh, World Stock Exchange showing that the certain number of stocks listed, but not too many stocks. So buying stocks is not really that common to, to uh, invest your money because the liquidity is not there and, and the return is not that high. So most of the uh, investment vehicle, I believe for domestic uh, Bhutanese people will be focused on fixed income. So is it all the money going to only deposit? That will be kind of un, un, uncomfortable kind of feeling. So my argument is it's behavioral, even though I'm guessing that you have to have some government bond that maybe it's easier to, you feel more safer and, and other banks and you have a lot of money over there and the interest rate differential is not that high and the term is different. So it's called allocation. So you allocate a little bit of everything, even though you don't have high return. If you go for the highest return, all money go to one thing, one investment product, and you don't feel comfortable. And that's my only answer to you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Lewis. I also, I still see a dodgy hand is up. Is that an old hand or a new one? <laughs> so do you have any questions for that? Sorry, oh. that was the old one. Okay. <laughs> Long time no see, Dodgy san. <laughs> okay, so very, very nice presentation. Thank you. Thank Do you. Have any, any observation for Professor Lewis, Dodgy? Uh, not much, uh, except that, uh, like you said, for Bhutan, uh, I think uh, without uh, rating, it would uh, prove to be an expensive affair for for the government to raise even if we explore the possibility of having, although it suits our market, but uh, at the same time, I guess it is important for us to take uh, the cost as well as into consideration while raising funds, right? Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dochi. Uh, I'm just trying to get back. Okay. Uh, is there any other questions for either Professor Lewis or Professor Yoshino um, regarding the uh, the bond issuance? I understand that there's actually a lot of impending questions based on my conversation earlier with the staff at the Ministry of Finance. So if actually this this workshop is really meant to be you know, for consultation, uh, con uh, conversation, and uh, an opportunity to ask any questions you may have to take um, the next step forward for the bond market in Bhutan. Uh, excuse me. Yes. Uh, okay, uh, Yeshi um, is raising his hands. Yes, please, Yeshi. Uh, 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 my question is regarding this uh, about the getting into the international markets. So, knowingly that uh, there is a currency exchange rate risk for Bhutan for jumping into an international market. 
So being a very like a expertise in financial sector, uh, financial expertise. So why the professor is uh, is giving this type of advice to the government? So what is the more advantage you could see uh, beside the uh, beside the interest rate advantage? Or only from the inter uh, interest rate ad advantage, I think you uh, your uh, presentation seems to be pressing on that thing. So what are the other key uh, advantage that we could uh, get by getting to the interest rate market, uh, having this uh, some action rate risk uh, we, we could see for everyone? Okay, it's a fair question. Uh, I think if you look at from a rough definition, when we say risk, what a risk that we see from a government perspective as the uh, Professor Yoshino mentioned that the default risk, I believe that for Bhutan government is zero. So there's no default risk. So from the investor perspective, I don't see that they will see there's a default risk. Now for the Bhutan government perspective, the risk you see is currency risk because you do not know when you pay back the interest and the principal three years later, if US dollar appreciates so much against the domestic currency, you have to spend a lot more domestic money to buy back, and that will cost a lot more money than you think, right? So the risk is about capital, about currency appreciation against you. The risk is about more money spent. So if you look at academic framework, so on one hand, by tapping into the international market, you will receive a lot more demand. That's very important, remember, Demand supply, Professor uh, Yoshino mentioned about you have to balance both when you issue bond. The much bigger 99% international investor now interested in buying your bond. Let's pretend for the sake of argument, we use US dollar. The demand will drive your bond coupon down when you do the roadshow. Let's say for the sake of argument, 3.5% for three years. That 3.5% versus 6.5% is 3% interest rate cost. That can be used as the cushion for you to remove or to reduce the so-called risk of paying more money back three to five years later on. So therefore, everything here is about money. When you say risk, because there's no default risk, you don't worry about, you take the other people money, so there's no risk of losing money. You pay back, people don't worry about you will not pay back because you are a sovereign country, you will have no default risk. So the only thing to talk about here is the price. And the price you say to me, with the projectile now COVID-19, US dollar is the all time, and the chance that you will receive now when in the future, they will go even higher, is unthinkable. So most likely from last year to now this year, my guess, of course, educated guess only, still stands, which is if you issue US bond, a bond now, dollar bond now, the chance that you pay back actually will lower because you cannot expect that US dollar stays that high for the three, five, six, ten 10 years. Maybe the same number, so you have no risk, lower, you actually gain. So in that regard, it's not just about academic debate about risk, it's about also the direction of the currency at this point you stand in the world and look future three to five years, what is the probability of the risk against you or in favor of you? And that is why I think it's a good time. Of course, I'm now saying this with my own viewpoint. When you actually do it, you will have somebody professional to predict and to help, and they will be a lot more convincing than I do now. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Okay. okay. Um, any other questions from the participants? Yes, uh, I, I have a question, Professor. Yes. Uh, well, uh, would be other prerequisites uh, say if we uh, float a thematic bond like green bond in our domestic market for the purpose of attracting international investors besides having a sovereign rating what would be other prerequisites that's necessary to attract uh, the foreign investors I suppose if we float okay a, a very good question 
And I think I was, at, I still remember most of the time I was in Bhutan last year. At the end of our discussion, I was so excited. I stood up in December last year and I convinced all of you that Bhutan has already got the prerequisite. Because as an international person visiting Bhutan, as a tourist, as a, a finance academic, I visit Bhutan for five days. I think you underestimate, not you, but in general, uh, Bhutanese people are very conservative. You are humble. And actually, just to demonstrate happiest index, to demonstrate how you protect your territory in COVID-19 and how you treat people when the due diligence team for international advisory team to come to see you guys, I think they will see you meet all the prerequisites. At the end of the day, this is about whether people think Bhutan is a place to invest the money while then do good to the society. Now, you have a good reputation, you already do good to a society environmentally and socially without other people telling you to do so. Other people now using social bond and green bond in European or in US, or especially now in China, Hong Kong, we promote the usage of green bond is to use the power of money to force the companies to actually do good in ENS and G. Look at the last page of my presentation from my assistant, the green bond investment ESG loop. The more green bond you issue, the higher the E rating of the ESG, the investor like high ESG score by your stock, therefore the stock demand is stronger, better liquidity, better stock price. Therefore, the company managers and the CEO like this idea and say, how oh, green bond help me to have high ESG rating, there are no more people buying my stock now. They hold it, they don't flip it. Therefore, they will issue more green bond. This reinforcement cycle is already there for us to enforce. But for Bhutan, we don't need to do that because you already done a good job. We just want to make sure that you have enough money to keep doing a good job. Now that to international investor, it's much easier task. We don't need to use the money to force them to do good thing on E. We just want to make sure that you have money to keep continuing doing what you have been doing. Now, to me, you meet all the prerequisites. <laughs> Again, I'm as optimistic after one year later. <laughs> good, good to know that. Thank I you, hope sir. our policymakers will take note of that and uh, maybe uh, would be an option to float it in a domestic market in case of we have uh, deficit financing issues. Yes, that I understand. Yes. Thanks. 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 Okay. Uh, th thank you, Dorji. I think I have uh, similar questions uh, coming from uh, the latest uh, remark from Dorji. Is that wouldn't it be advisable? Uh, this is from uh, Eugene uh, Chomo. Uh, wouldn't it be advisable to first explore demand for royal government bond, green bond within Bhutan? then go for international market. So. I believe that if that will help to ease the uncertainty tension on currency risk, that will also address the learning curve to adopt to the green protocol, the green requirement. I think that's a great idea because the recurring of budget deficit financing is there. So why don't the government consider using the green framework internally and see whether the domestic people make a differentiation in the interest rate, in the demand, or they don't care. You can test a little bit. In the meantime, you can also use it as an experiment to test your ability to put together a green or social bond framework, which you can easily have somebody second party verification and say, this is following this verification framework, it doesn't cost much money. Then you can see your ability in terms of administration of different departments in the government to put together such a document. I think that's a good idea. If that currency risk is so strong in, in the mind of many, many senior management in the government that stop you from doing it, so be it. Uh, thank you, Professor Lewis. I, I actually would like to perhaps um, have a follow-up question from that uh, to actually both Professor Lewis and Professor Yoshino. 
I hope he, yes, if he, I think he's still around, right? Um, Professor Yoshino, <laughs> is that you see, if Bhutan has many things from several years of engagement in Bhutan, Bhutan has done several things that are not according to, you know, perhaps uh, all the textbook that we've also learned. Um, in this, the, of course, they're now issuing the, the bonds. Now they have issued corporate bonds before the, the development of the market. You know, basically, it has leapfrogged many preconditions and many uh, sequencing. Actually, we kind of think that it should be, you know, it should be carefully built before uh, going forward, moving to the next stage of financial market development. But that has happened in Bhutan. Uh, it, there's so many interesting uh, things coming. So I wonder, you know, because of, of course, at the moment we're COVID-19, we're not doing anything normal anymore. It's an opportunity probably to leave from or opportunity to read the COVID, as Gerald has mentioned, from the Bhutan side and, and our, and many of the, our proposal side is the, the aspects of financial stability, right? That the, whether they have the market infrastructure ready, whether, you know, um, the central bank has not even developed a, a proper uh, a money market or repo market. And those those things are not in place. Capital control is not relaxed. Isn't that something that we should uh, try to also reform before um, issuing any particular further the green bonds or more uh, sovereign bonds uh, going forward? Just just that I'm curious because sometimes you know we, we worry so much also about the financial stability aspect but it doesn't actually um, stay in, in provide instability so uh, just just want to hear your view on that and i think okay, let, let more questions coming up maybe maybe uh, professor uh, uh Yusino can can uh, add a lot more uh, last time i remember dodgy from world stock exchange mentioned about financial innovation technology help to lift up the development of the investment market I think financial innovation can be adopted in Bhutan's case. You don't have to follow textbook about the repo market, this and that. Think about this. If the Chinese government now announced they have the government push cryptocurrency, right? Like those, uh, you know, digital currency that you can use. And now I have company approach me. It's a large European firm. They are talking about green trade credit. But a green trade credit is not really something you need to have any system. It's a digital system from the bank to the company with the information system. You type in information, you fulfill certain requirement for your greenness or your social compliance. You get a trade credit is cheaper. Now, if you get a cheaper trade credit, who will give this trade credit? Who will finance this trade credit? I would say green bond. So to me, you can think about the technology of digital platform to help to mobilize money strictly from green money to green trade credit to people that actually run business, manufacturing firms and service firms will receive better terms in the bank. And this can be a, a project, an innovation project without much of the central bank system in place to worry about anything. It's a digital currency system. Okay, uh, thank you, um, Professor Lewis. Um, okay, um, then I'm not sure whether Professor Yoshino has any view on this. I think he's disconnected. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. Um, I have an in interesting question coming from our friend, Alpo Aras. He actually used to be a regional advisor on financing for development at UNSCAP. Um, his question is interesting. Is it possible to maintain fixed rate regime by removing capital control, i.e. opening its capital market for foreign investor? For example, Turkey and South Africa could not handle to keep their foreign investors they leave immediately, uh, smell any instability to keep the exchange rate stable. So a fair question that raised by uh, Professor Yoshino about the case of bankruptcy at uh, Greece. 
because the foreign investor pull out the money, so there's no more financing. Domestic does not buy enough. The demand is not strong enough for the uh, sovereign bond, so therefore create a default problem. Therefore, the EU has to come in, the IMF is coming, in, all these things. We totally understand that. So before we draw a conclusion about from Turkey or a country like Europe about the international investor moving in and out quickly, first you think about the scale of what you have done, and second, who are you selling to? I think Bhutan is a is a small country. Your issue is not large. Therefore, you have the luxury to select the stable investor. You don't have to sell to anybody walk in the town and say, "Oh, you're international." Let's sell you the, the green bond. I don't think you need to do that. I think you can be highly selective to look at the international participants and see if they bid for the interest and then decide, that, are they long-term investors? Do you trust them? All this relationship has to be built before you, before you actually issue the green with a large size. So you cannot have both. Double-edged sword. If you want cheaper cost, a biggest issue size will be cheaper. Low price cost because the graduation of the less developing country status is shown. And eventually the international investor should have a role in financing the infrastructure of Bhutan. If not today, five years later, 10 years later, I don't see how you can just finance by domestic. Japan is a very different country. Japan has a lot of internal consumption. It's largely driven. Even the IBANs, most people don't speak English. They have a sufficient system within the country. And can, can Bhutan do that? Can Bhutan close it economically, financially, and do not go out? I believe that one day you need to, because there's a lot of advantages. So taking small step at a time, to learn about whether it's really a tiger out there, out of the cave, or it's not a tiger, it's just a cat. You worry about a big tiger, it's actually not really a tiger, it's a small cat. So maybe it's a dog, maybe it's a wolf, but maybe not a tiger. So to me, trying, then some fear will be gone. To me, the last word will be, by practicing, by walking the trail, the unknown becomes clear, and you will have less unsafe feelings because you're now watching from a closer distance. You're not watching from a far away distance. You think, oh, there is dark, everything is dangerous. But you walk closer, actually it's not that dangerous because it's just too far to see. So to me, a small step for domestic bond, a small step for international investor to, to take a taste what they are giving you, then you can decide. Maybe you have already, maybe you talk to the European Investment Bank, but you already know what they want. So I do not know enough to know how much you have taste the international investor uh, uh, participation, but certainly it's worth it to try. And the COVID-19 is the perfect time to try because interest rates are so low. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Lewis. So um, in this case, do you think um, Bhutan needs to develop a secondary uh, market for bond market development, given that, you know, uh, I mean, what is the, 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 the advantage of, of developing active uh, secondary market through international bond insurance? I mean, if they can actually buy and hold the bond, as you know, Professor Yoshino mentioned earlier, that he kind of encouraged more long-term holdings. I mean, what would be the benefits of a secondary market uh, for, for Bhutan in this case? I think I listened to the uh, concern last time in December from different banks. They said that if they can issue deposit and they can actually buy bond domestically, hold it to maturity, and there's no reason to sell it because interest rate is so high. And last time I saw a documentation of from the economic development, plan development, the inflation rate is about 6%. A year ago, maybe it's lower because of the COVID-19 uh, financial distress. The 6% inflation rate or 4% inflation rate is really high. So with that kind of expectation, this interest rate that you give to a saving deposit or a bond has to be high, right? So therefore, I don't see how without an external stimulus, if in economics in paper, we write, we call external shock. Without somebody shock the system, I don't see how the domestic investor will change the behavior, start trading the bonds. They just keep buying it, holding it. 
with issue, maturity, keep buying and holding it. So therefore, there will be never a liquidity, whenever trading in, in the bond market or the stock market. The only way to bring some liquidity is to create, of course, the textbook case is called the investor, it's called the speculator. And most Asian people hate the term speculator because when you have a trade, somebody buys, somebody sell. And the speculator play a role of not speculating the word in English is wrong. It should be this kind of party trader to take the opposite direction. And some of this is speculate the other direction. Now, when you have a speculator or a trader in the market, of course, they will create volatility. They will create also liquidity. You cannot have liquidity without volatility, right? So to me, it's managed volatility, not unbound volatility. So the conclusion here is, let's try to have some educated international investor, somebody a friendly, and they can create a market-making system for you. Don't bring the tiger to your home. Bring some good people to help you to support the trading, the liquidity. Because without liquidity, there's no international market. Without international market, you eventually with a very closed system, economically, for Bhutan too small to be closed. For Japan, U.S., China, they can be big enough to have everything within. They can circle money, circle goods. They can be a closed system. So to me, for Bhutan to prosper, to, to improve the standard of living and life, some internalization, internationalization will be needed. And one good way to start that is green bond again. <laughs> I think I should rest my case. I think they're all tired. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Yoshino. I would like to, again, um, uh, one more round. If there's no further questions, I think we may uh, be closing this meeting. Uh, so I'll wait for a few minutes uh, while waiting. I would like to say that if um, the audience here have any further questions uh, for Professor Yoshino or Professor Lewis, uh, please feel free to you know, submit the questions to, to ask you and SCAP and we'll uh, convey to them. I think the content of today's workshop is very rich and that both professors have provided a very interesting angles and give us a comprehensive ideas on uh, bond issuance. Of course, um, you know, we are both at UNSCAP and at Putan. We are actually uh, doing capacity building by uh, doing it, learning by doing and actually uh, doing it. So, of course, a combination of cautious, um, being caution and a combination of taking action. So uh, with that, I, I would like to perhaps um, in in our meeting uh, for today, I, I just want to ask whether Professor Yo, um, Yoshino has left, but Professor Lewis has any last word before we close this? Okay, so um, in that case, I'd like to uh, hand over uh, the virtual microphone to Pachara, please. Thank you, Tian. Thank, thank you, Tian and Professor Lewis. So that's wrap for both sessions. Um, uh, Kuntian, please uh, stay on. So we now come to the closing session. Please, uh, Kuntian, keep uh, giving your closing remarks, please. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, participants, ladies and gentlemen. I think the topics have been successfully addressed today in greater detail, uh, along with the policymakers, uh, multilateral organizations, financial and academic institutions, and key stakeholders. We have discussed the present issues on bond market development in Bhutan, as well as these alternative financial instruments. I believe that today's interactive dialogue have proposed uh, several uh, new ideas for such bond issuance. We also clearly recognize the challenges we face in terms of issuing uh, sovereign bonds or thematic green bonds, that we must work harder to develop an enabling capital market environment to attain inclusive and sustainable growth for all in Bhutan. I'd like to say that SCAP remains committed to assist member states, including Bhutan, to build back better for a more resilient future. 
I also would like to announce uh, the next uh, opportunity for us to get together again. We will jointly organize another important conference with the Royal Securities Exchange of Bhutan, actually in two weeks time, under the topic of digital finance transformation in Bhutan, in a virtual platform on 9 December in the afternoon around the same time. If you are interested, I would like to take this opportunity to invite you all here to attend our next conference. We we'll also be touching up upon some aspects of capital market, but focusing more on uh, the aspect of digital finance and tokenization for Bhutan. This is done in collaboration with the Royal Security Exchange of Bhutan. Last but not least, I would like to once again thank the Ministry of Finance of Bhutan uh, for their support in making this event such a, a, a success and my sincere appreciation to all experts, Professor Yoshino, Professor Lewis, the participants who engaged with us today to kindly share their time and insight with us. I hope to see you again soon. I hope in person next year when we find the vaccine. But in the meantime, let's work together to translate our joint commitment into action in the year ahead and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stay healthy. Good night. <laughs> OK, thank you. And see you next time. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, distinguished participant for taking part in uh, today's meeting. All materials will be uploaded into SCAP website. Uh, meanwhile, we greatly appreciate your, appreciate your feedback. We, you will be receiving the email uh, for uh, doing the survey to help you and SCAP to improve on organizing the meeting. So please, if you receive the, the email for you, please just help uh, do the, the survey. Uh, if any like uh, technical connection limitation hiccup today, so apologize. We, 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 we try to like improve it to the best next time. And uh, last, I would like to thank you colleague uh, from Ministry of Finance, Bhutan, Madam Laden Lotte, Chief Program Officer, Jet Management Division of Department uh, Department of Macroeconomic Affairs of Ministry of Finance, uh, for her kind coordination, communication, and arranging for today virtual meeting. So, uh, please stay healthy and happy, and look forward to seeing you all again in the next meeting. Thank you very much. Goodbye, all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Bye, pressure. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Thanks.